Welcome everyone. I see there's a number of people joining. That's great. Um, so we're going to get started. It is 12 o'clock, so I just want to welcome everyone. My name is Jennifer McKinnon and I'm with the Lung Health Foundation. I am pleased to be one of the hosts for today's session, Spirometry Testing for Diagnosing Asthma and COPD in Primary Care, the Why and the How. The Lung Health Foundation is dedicated to ending gaps in the prevention, diagnosis, and care of lung disease in Canada. We invest in the future by driving groundbreaking research, and we give patients and families the programs and supports they need today. On behalf of the Lung Health Foundation, I am pleased to bring to you this workshop in support of the recently launched Choosing Wisely campaign, Let's Clear the Air. The Airways campaign encourages thoughtful conversations between clinicians and patients who have received a diagnosis of asthma or COPD. The goal of the campaign is to avoid unnecessary treatment or misdiagnosis that can occur without spirometry testing. I have a number of guests with me today. Um, before I introduce our moderator, there are a couple of housekeeping slides. Uh, the first one, um, you'll see here that this program has received financial support from the Ministry of Health of Ontario as part of the government's asthma and COPD program. Here you'll see the steps that we took to mitigate any potential bias. You'll see that all speakers, moderators, and authors completed the uh, conflict of interest form, and these disclosures are will be made known today during the presentation. Uh, you'll see that industry is not represented on the planning committee and has not provided any input into the program. Just a couple of housekeeping items. We do ask that participants remain muted when not speaking or asking a question. The session is being recorded and the link will be provided to all registrants. When you wish to ask a question, please put it in the chat box. We are monitoring the questions throughout and we are we, are, we will be saving questions for the end. Um, when we are, we are in the breakout uh, rooms later on, you will be able to raise your hand to ask a question as well and come off mute. If you have any technical problems throughout, if your computer lags or the sound is just not working, um, try refreshing your browser. If the problem is not resolved, just send us a quick note in the chat box and ask for help. And just want to alert you that we will be using the polling feature and you will be, we will let you know when, when this feature is about to be utilized. So with that, I would like to introduce our moderator. Um, Dr. Itamar Tamari has been working at Stonegate Community Health Centre in Toronto since 1998. He completed his doctorate in medicine at the University of Toronto in 1992 and his training in family medicine in 1994. He is the medical director of the Primary Care Asthma Program, which is one of the asthma and COPD programs under the Ministry of Health in Ontario. He has chaired its advisory since 2002. He is also a founding member of the Primary Care Respiratory Alliance of Canada. So welcome, Dr. Tamari. Uh, I'll let you take, take it from here. All right. Thanks, Jennifer. Welcome, everybody. Really good to be here. I uh, just wanted to start off with uh, my conflict of interest. Uh, I've only received financial sponsorship from the Lung Health Foundation, otherwise from nobody else. And I just want to remind people for the docs uh, specifically uh, that uh, this uh, program is certified for three main pro plus credits through the college. Uh, the ID number is up on the board there. And uh, as a reminder, there will be a post-reflective survey to be completed one to two months after this program and uh, everybody will get an email link for that. I'm just going to start off with the objectives for today. Uh, we hope people will be able to recognize the importance of objective tests for patients with suspected respiratory disease and how to use spirometry, which is a relatively simple non-invasive test to improve the care provided to patients. To help uh, illustrate how spirometry along with patient history, symptoms and physical findings will support accurate diagnosis of lung disease uh, to help define the measurements of lung function, get everybody familiar with that and their application to interpretation of spirometry. And of course, to differentiate between normal restrictive and obstructive uh, spirometric patterns. We're gonna go over through all of that with the key throughout the, the presentation. So <clears throat> I wanted to introduce our speaker, Dr. Chris uh, Davis. Uh, so he completed his undergrad medical degree at UFT in 2013. He then completed his residency in internal medicine at U of Western in 2016 and his fellowship in respirology in 
at uh, Queens in 2018. He's now appointed as adjunct professor with Queens School of Medicine and has hospital privileges at Kingston Health Sciences. He's also managing partner at Kingston Respiratory Services, which is Kingston's only community respirology clinic and PFT testing lab. So welcome, Dr. Davis. So thank you for having me. I appreciate everybody taking the time. I know it's, it's been a, a busy few months as the world sort of restarts after COVID, so I appreciate people taking the time to participate. Um, we do have a lot of material to go through, so without further ado, I'm going to launch myself sort of right into things. Um, as mentioned, again, if people do have questions, please ask them in the chat box. We will circle back at the end. If they are uh, sort of hot or burning, then uh, Dr. Er, Itamar uh, will uh, bring them up and we can go over things. So the first part of, of all this that I, I think is quite important for spirometry is just understanding the, you know, the, the how or the, sorry, the why behind asthma and COPD. And so the first thing you'd say, well, in general, why are we, why are we doing CO or spirometry? Is that very much it's the initial step in the diagnosis of things like asthma and COPD. It's necessary because it gives us a numeric representation of the severity of lung diseases, which in turn is very helpful to try and to determine the, the prognosis for it. Um, over time, we will use these sort of in serial or repeated tests to try and get an idea of progression. Um, and in some cases, you're also going to look at it as a response to therapy. So over time, if I put somebody on an inhaler and I repeat testing, am I, you know, am I seeing improvements? Uh, it, it's a very helpful tool for that. You know, the, the comparator being is that treating blood pressure for cardiology, you would use a blood pressure monitor and it gives you a numeric reading rather than just relying on subjective patient reports of symptoms like cough and shortness of breath. Um, so having a, a representative uh, sort of sample of things provides quite a rich uh, source of information, which is helpful towards the diagnosis of some of these diseases. The biggest problem we run into is unfortunately it's, it's very much an underused resource, uh, especially spirometry itself, is that much of the pulmonary testing generally is in pulmonary function testing labs, of which many cities actually don't have. And the availability of, of spirometry within the community is something that is growing, but really is something that I'm going to try and convince you that it should grow even further uh, as a resource. And the problem that we have is that in the absence of spirometry, we end up with a significant problem of overdiagnosis, is that people with the label of asthma and COPD who have never had spirometry, um, the, you know, the symptoms that usually lead to that are things like dyspnea, wheeze, cough, shortness of breath, but asthma and COPD are not the only respiratory diseases that will cause those. And if we're using just patient reported symptoms, um, as, as part of your, your diagnosis. Oh, did it click forward too? Or did it? Oh, so this is the one. Um, and so in a, a large Canadian study, for example, just to put some numbers to this, you'd say, well, 33% of the patients who had a diagnosis of asthma from their physician in the last five years actually didn't have a true diagnosis of asthma. Um, and about 79% of those people who shouldn't have been given the diagnosis up front were actually taking inhalers, which is, again, a huge problem because we're over-medicating um, a number of patients. And then you, you basically say the same thing. So about 60% of patients who receive a clinical diagnosis of COPD actually don't have that diagnosis when you objectively test them. Um, and we're going to circle back to touch on this a little bit more, but it, it's actually quite an important uh, problem. And so on the, the flip side, we, you know, we have overdiagnosis problem. Underdiagnosis is also the, the problem, is that it, it tends to be a, a noisy minority that we catch and get overdiagnosed. But there's also a, if you will, stoic um, group of patients who, despite respiratory problems, will not present to their family doctor or don't report those symptoms because they just assume that's what normal breathing is. And so the trouble we have if we're not looking for it and screening for it and actually doing numeric testing for it is that it gets missed. So you'd say asthma itself is probably 20 to 70 percent um, of community dwelling patients are underdiagnosed. And it's about the same in COPD is that we catch the tip of the iceberg, but probably about 70 percent of the patients worldwide remain undiagnosed and unrecognized. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the consequence of missing this diagnosis is that you're not able to treat it at its earlier stages where it's often more manageable. You miss catching patients who otherwise could be diverted away from emergency departments and hospitals. Um, and in the, you know, the, the long term, you, you result in, in further lung damage that doesn't necessarily uh, need to occur. So there, there is quite a system cost um, to missing these diagnoses. And then if we, you know, if we take a step back, and, and this alludes to what I was saying, is that the, the first thing is, you know, the, the definition of asthma itself, and we're going to see the definition of COPD, they're, they're relatively 
generic as far as their symptoms. So you'd say, you know, it's, it's asthma is a disease of chronic airways inflammation uh, characterized by symptoms like shortness of breath, chest tightness, cough. Again, those are very generic to most. What I think is most important, if there's something to stick in your mind for asthma, is that it, it's variable airflow obstruction or variable airflow limitation. And then there's airway hyperresponsiveness. So in essence, you have good days, you have bad days, depending on what triggers you around. Um, so asthma is, is a disease of very much ups and downs. Um, and we're gonna see as, as we go forward, that COPD is, is, is a disease of a fixed airflow obstruction. And so more specifically sort of on the asthma side of things, and this was a statement from the, the Health Quality Ontario uh, sort of asthma quality standards. It was published back in 2017 is essentially they, they made the, the idealistic statement that any sort of adults and children over the age of six who are clinically suspected of asthma should have spirometry that demonstrates reversible airflow obstruction, and we'll get into that definition a bit more, or they should at least um, have uh, basically bronchopulpation challenge testing if they didn't have that uh, reversible airflow obstruction. And it, it really it should be done as soon as possible because that confirms our diagnosis and tells us we don't need to be looking for alternative diagnoses to explain these symptoms. The trouble is we know when you look at, at studies of the data that that unfortunately doesn't happen. And again, this was a sort of a study where they went back on chart review. So 613 Canadians diagnosed with asthma in the last five years, they ended up retesting. 66% of them had asthma, good. Problem is 33% of them didn't, which is, I had talked about that on a prior slide. Um, again, that leads to a lot of over-medication. You know, 35% only took a medication daily is, is a statement unto itself that you could spend a while talking about how, unfortunately, compliance with meds is not great. But I think what's most important is 90% of those people could safely stop the medication um, for one year. Without, so again, that's a, a huge burden of extra over-medication. And in the world we live now with you know, cardiac disease and endocrine and, and the list of medications you see people on, both the cost and the potential side effects are, are not insignificant. And when you look back, the most important thing that we're, we're sort of touching on today is the fact that of the 530 patients to see how they were originally diagnosed, um, about 40, say, you know, 50% of them did not have airflow testing or spirometry to show you. It was all just based on clinical signs and symptoms, which is a, a slippery slope of things because a lot um, of different diseases can sound like asthma, um, but are not necessarily asthma, if you will. And so when we go to the, the overdiagnosis again, as we said, is you're going to miss the true diagnosis. So when you've looked back in some of these studies, the alternative diagnoses that were actually found to be the case instead of asthma are common things like rhinitis, it can be acid reflux, it can be you know, anxiety or hyperventilation syndromes. But what I think is most important is that about 6% of them actually represented unrecognized serious cardiopulmonary conditions, such as coronary artery disease or other airway obstructive phenomenon like a subglottic stenosis, where the airway is actually stricturing itself shut. Um, and the danger is, is once somebody has a label of a disease, it, it, it's amazing how everybody just sort of will follow that. So a patient goes back to an emergency saying, I'm so short of breath, my inhalers aren't working. They'll just get more asthma inhalers. Um, and so that initial diagnosis and labeling a patient is a very big uh, impact on their, their potential future as far as their management. Again, cost goes without saying. Unfortunately, a lot of, especially asthmatics, tend to be in the young to middle age range, often under uh, insured or not insured at all. And these medications, you know, a controller is, is usually at least $80 a month uh, for an, an ICS. Once you get into ICS labs, you're, you're looking at $80 to $160 a month. So that is an incredible addition in cost to someone who's paying out of pocket for these drugs. There are programs like the Trillium Drug Benefits Program that tries to defray some of this. But again, paying that cost when you don't actually need it or when you haven't done this for you to confirm it is really what we're trying to avoid. Um, and what you'd say is, you know, the average patient, unfortunately, because they don't take their medications on a regular basis, is, is probably about $350 a year you can save just by discontinuing unnecessary meds. Um, there are also side effects from the medications themselves. Um, they are not as severe as other, you know, oral medications that we would see elsewhere in medicine, but you do still have vocal uh, hoarseness from deposition of the steroid. You have the risk of oral thrush. People get heart palpitations. A lot of people have hand tremors, which they find quite disruptive. Um, children can have growth impairment. So there, there are not negligible side effects from these. Um, and then the other thing is just the impacts of mental health. Again, giving somebody the label of asthma does come with worsened health, uh, anxiety-related outcomes. You do get feelings of isolation. Um, and especially in younger patients, you know, being labeled with it does uh, have a, a big effect to you know, your teenagers and, and early adults. Um, and then 
the the one that we will start to see, especially at this time of year, as everybody starts getting ready to go down to Florida, is there, there's an effect on travel and insurance, um, and new inhalers or changes to inhalers will have a huge effect at uh, preventing some people from being able to travel without exceptionally high or significant exceptions. Um, and so, you know, if you're giving somebody a lifelong diagnosis and a lifelong label, PFTs or spirometry are really essential to catch them up front. But again, we would say from studies, it's only like 40 or 50% of people actually get that up front, which is, is a bit of a, um, you know, you wouldn't diagnose hypertension without doing a blood pressure monitor. It, it really should be thought of in the same way with, with asthma, is that if you haven't done the testing, you can have suggestions of it, but you need the confirmatory testing. Um, and this would be the confirmatory testing. So the, the criteria as outlined by the Canadian Thoracic Society is essentially would say they need to have a reduced FTC1 to FVC. And what we use is what's called the lower limit of normal for age predicted. And what that does is it normalizes it based on age, sex, height, and ethnicity. So it's a very, the old days of less than 0.7 that, or 70% that a lot of us remember, that's not very good because in younger people, their lower limit is actually much higher than 0.7. They can be 0 0.8, 0 0.9. And as patients age, that lower limit will drop, so it'll be less than, than 0 0.7. So it, it prevents overdiagnosis in, in young and old. Um, and in children, you'd say it's a 12% increase. So they have to have an impaired FEV1 to FVC less than their, their age predicted lower limit normal. And they have to have a, a change of their FEV1 post bronchodilator of more than 12%. In adults, it's that same criteria, so the obstructed FEV1 to FVC. But then you, you also have this 12% and a minimum of 200 cc's. And that just normalizes, if you think of the bell curve of, of that, as it just normalizes body type, so big and tall or short and, and sort of more rotund, um, is it catches those, those two extremes of things when you, you include that as a secondary uh, marker of things. As we've mentioned, so if you did that testing, if you do spirometry and there's no, and you have significant hints based on the clinical history that you're thinking asthma is there, and it, you don't see the criteria that we just went over here, but you still think, there's something here that, that smells like asthma to me. The next test that you'll often see recommended and, and will often be recommended as, as part of the report for a normal spirometry in a high concern patient is that you do bronchoprovocation. So you'd say if they don't demonstrate airflow reversibility day in and day out, what we want to see is if I challenge their lungs, do I get a tightening uh, or a constriction that would support that there's bronchial hyperreactivity and variability over time. Um, and so with COVID lately, this has been unfortunately a very hard category of tests to get done because often this makes people cough. It's an aerosolized, nebulized medication that we're using uh, with the methacholine. So we haven't really been doing a whole bunch of these over the past few years, but gradually local hospitals are starting this back up. And I think over the next year or so, we're going to see this come back into its own um, because it is such a helpful tool in the diagnosis. So methacholine is the typical one you'd see. You breathe it in and slight and gradually increasing doses. And what we're trying to see is as you get to the higher doses, is there a tightening of the lung tissue? Um, we can also do exercise challenge ones. So you get people to pedal on a bike or run on a treadmill, and then they'll do spirometry afterwards, um, looking for a tightening post-exercise. And th there is all, all, you know, a whole bunch of different contraindications, but I think the most important one to keep in your mind is an FEV1 less than 60% or less than 1.5 liters for adults. Um, for challenge testing, it's like exercise, it is a bit of a higher threshold. And then your typical uh, sort of contraindications are essentially anything that would be at risk from repeated efforts where you're, you're putting a high uh, sort of expiratory force. So if you've got a recent MI, uncontrolled hypertension, aortic aneurysm, eye surgery or intracranial surgery, any of those that a sudden <sighs> maneuver when you're pushing really hard is potentially uh, at risk of injuring these other conditions, you'd say probably not worth doing a test where you're gonna do that over and over and over again. Um, and what's interesting is when you look, so if you look at a study, so this is based on patients who had a negative bronchodilator response. They had normal spirometry, but they had a high threshold or thought of asthma in the background. Of the 500 subjects that went through this, 43% of them had a, a positive methacholine challenge test. And so that, again, shows you that, great, you caught 43% of the people and diagnosed them with asthma. But it's also very important to say that the other, you know, 60 odd percent of patients didn't have asthma, despite having signs and symptoms and, and reported features that seemed like asthma. And if we had just gone with the, well, your spirometry is normal, everything else sounds like asthma, you probably have asthma, it would result in a significant, significant overdiagnosis in these patients. Um, what you would say though is, again, there, there is a small subset that I should mention here as well. So of the 231 subjects who didn't have a positive methacholine, who were subsequently referred to respirologists, there's about 12% of that that you'd still pull out 
and say probably had asthma and that's when you're getting into rare like cough variant asthmas and, and different subtypes um or patients who were treated up to the point of the methacholine with inhalers that might have had a false negative so th there is a, a small section that you're going to catch um in that but again it still would say that there's a risk of overdiagnosis. Um, as you said, the, the methacholine challenge, your criteria is essentially going to be a PC20 less than four milligrams per mil, um, is considered a positive, is a like a very strong positive, four to 16 milligrams per mil, because we go up, or we start at a very low dose and we go up in the dose towards 16, is borderline. So if you were in that range and you had very strong other signs and symptoms of asthma, you would sort of support the diagnosis, and any more than 16 means they have no bronchial hyperreactivity and it's negative. And then exercise challenge, what we look for is a 10 to 15% decrease in the FEV1. So basically, as they stop exercising, everything tightens down. Um, and that's what we want to see on their spirometry after exercise. And so shifting gears away from the asthma side of it, you'd say, well, COPD is the other one. And as I said, asthma, if it sticks in your mind, is the temporal variability. It goes up and down, sort of like a roller coaster. They have good days and bad days. COPD instead is smoking related or uh, sort of burning biomass or heavy particulate exposure. Um, causing damage to the lung tissue. And by and large in North America, someone born and raised here, it, cigarette smoke is the, the main. Um, in, in patients from certain countries where there's a lot of indoor unprotected cooking fires or a lot of indoor combustion fires, that's where we'll see other causes of, of COPD, which is usually, again, sort of burning biomass. Um, and it's a fixed airflow obstruction. So the lung is damaged from the exposure to the, the cigarette smoke and whatnot and it doesn't come back. You don't regain that lung function. You can't reopen it because it is destroyed and damaged as part of the process. And you'd sort of divide COPD into there's a chronic bronchitic subtype, which is cough and mucus production. And there's an emphysematous subtype, which is the typical sort of emphysema and bully that you'll see on CT. Um, and most patients who have COPD are a blend of those two conditions. And so we go through the same thing here. You'd say, well, COPD, as we said, their general symptoms are going to be cough, mucus, wheeze, shortness of breath, which can tie into that. It could be a um, you know, ILD can have those same things. Uh, asthma can have the same. Bronchiectasis system look the same. And so really without COPD, you can't make the set diagnosis. So where you see like an x-ray reported as COPD really shouldn't be. You can report hyperinflation with flattening the diaphragms in an x-ray, but you can't make the diagnosis of COPD because it's very much a numerical diagnosis. Um, and it's the same thing. Overdiagnosis means we overmedicate people. We underestimate disease severity because we don't know where their baseline FEV1 is. You're probably putting them on the wrong mix of inhalers, depending on what the pattern on their imaging looks like. And if we miss all of this, patients end up in hospital more, they die more, and they, they're sort of more of a burden on the healthcare system. So catching these patients early, again, because it is a lifelong diagnosis and a lifelong label, is a very important feature of their, their disease. And so that's where you get this, this sort of quality is, is ideally within three months of sort of the suspicion of COPD, we should be doing spirometry to try and confirm that diagnosis. Um, again, if you have to sort of put numbers to it to try and, and convince people further is that um, this was a, a Gershon et al. study that was done, and they said it was so 1,400 patients over the age of 40. Um, among the 124 patients who were sort of clinically diagnosed with COPD, actually 58% of them did not have evidence of COPD on spirometry, which is the, again, that the pitfall of you can't just assume smoking really or causes COPD. Um, and it's the same idea here, you'd say. So Ontario study where they looked at COPD in primary care chart review, Basically, about 44% of patients diagnosed with COPD were likely overdiagnosed. Um, and that's the same thing we see internationally. It's about 62%. So it, anywhere between 40 to 60% of, of patients are unfortunately overdiagnosed if you're going just based on clinical signs and symptoms. Um, on the underdiagnosis side, again, it, it, it really does come down to the same population of patients you'd say in asthma, is that there's some patients who are very sensitive to their breathing and their shortness of breath, and they present and they risk being overdiagnosed. And there's a stoic other sort of population of patients who don't mention anything, and they risk being underdiagnosed. Um, and we know it's the same sort of flip on the other side. You'd say, you know, the underestimation of, of COPD diagnosis is probably 40, 50% of people. Um, and the, what I think is the most important is basically patients with this COPD have a, both a lower hospital admission and a lower mortality when their diagnosis is confirmed by spirometry, because they become a known quantity, they more likely end up on appropriate inhalers, they're recognized for it, and they're followed for the disease, rather than the ones that get missed. Um, and so having that numerical measure at some point to say, yes, this is COPD, we've confirmed we have the right diagnosis, is actually a very important feature. And 
you know, the, the biggest question you say is, well, I have all these people coming in my office. They're, they're coughing. They're short of breath. What do I do with them? Or how do I pick them out? And thankfully, there's a very quick, very easy test that can be administered, you know, in a few seconds at the bedside um, or in your office. Really, you can give it to them in the waiting room if you need to. Um, is that you'd say if patients are a smoker or ex-smoker over the age of 40 and you answer yes to any one of these questions, you should do spirometry at some point in this patient um, as part of their workup. And when you look at the question, it, it sort of harkens back to how I said COPD breaks down. So do you cough regularly or do you cough up phlegm? That's looking at that chronic bronchitis subtype. Do even simple chores make you short of breath or do you wheeze when you exert yourself at night? That's looking at your emphysematous subtype. And then this, do you get frequent colds that persist longer than people, have, uh, longer than uh, other people you know? That's just getting at the exacerbation. So if people are frequently exacerbating or have emphysema or chronic bronchitis sort of subtypes, they should have spirometry to try and characterize what the disease process is, be it COPD or something else. Um, so this is a very helpful way to filter things out and has been shown through relatively robust studies to be a very good way to, to catch COPD patients who otherwise would go unrecognized. Because what we know um, is, is, you know, we're all born with far more lung than we need. We start up here at the ideal, you know, near 100%. And over life, if we're a non-smoker, wear and tear uh, does lead to, to damage and loss of lung function over time. And different smokers have different degrees of susceptibility to cigarette smoke. So everybody has their own sort of personal curve in life, depending on where things are. But what we know is if you have a smoker who's losing lung, if they quit, Within a, a few weeks or a few months, they'll go back to losing lung at the same rate as a healthy, otherwise non-smoker. They just never regain that lung they've lost. But the trouble is in this range up here, most of us have far more lung than we need. And most of us will not notice any shortness of breath, despite the fact that we've lost 20, 30, even 40% of our lungs. Um, and so what the, the, you know, the, the ideal is, is that we're catching and we're recognizing, oh, you've got a history of smoking. You have some of these symptoms of cough and mucus production. And we're detecting it here to get them to quit to, to cut things off rather than they're coming into the office saying i can barely breathe my fingers are cyanotic and then we do it and we go whoops your, your fcv1 is 35 percent and we've missed all of this potential intervening time where we could have caught and made a difference through the, the path of their life and so early diagnosis and early detection is sort of the missing piece that we have in copd because often patients despite having lost quite a significant amount of lung don't present with symptoms um, and so I guess this leads to the first polling question that we have as, as part of the presentation today. Um, and so you'd say, so what confirms the presence of persistent airflow limitation in COPD? Okay, so the answers are coming in. It looks like most people are choosing the second option, post bronchodilator ratio less than lower limit of normal or less than 0 0.70. Perfect. Um, and so that, there we go. And so that that is the, the correct answer. And that's the important sort of differential between these two is that we'd say pre and post bronchodilator. As we said, um, what we, it needs to be persistent airflow limitation or fixed airflow obstruction is what we need. And so if the post, if the pre-bronchodilator FEV1 to FEC is, is obstructed, but it actually resolves afterwards, then it, it can't be a fixed airflow obstruction. It, it opened up when they were given bronchodilators. So what we need, and when you're looking at spirometry and the cases we're going to talk about to come, um, the post-bronchodilator FEV1 to FEC, ideally less than the lower limit of normal, because as we said, that is the most appropriate that is, is sort of ideal to the patient's age, weight, sex, ethnicity. If you don't have that or it's an older system, at least using a 0.7 is, is the way to go. Um, and that takes us to this. So the CTS criteria for the diagnosis of COPD is very much, again, it's a reduced FEV1 to FEC ratio. So ideally less than the lower limit of normal or less than 0 0.7 or 70% um, is sort of the historical way that that's always been uh, represented. And so that takes us sort of out of the why and now more into the how. And you'd say, well, how are we are we doing this? And how are we collecting the information with spirometry? Um, because understanding the test rather than getting a big field of numbers is actually quite important to things. Um, 
what is most important is to recognize that it is an effort dependent test. So it depends on how good the patient is coached to do the maneuvers. Um, if patients aren't well coached and aren't giving maximal efforts, you will get um, sort of submaximal curves and you'll get numbers that look awful that don't truly really represent what their lung function is. So having a skilled respiratory therapist, nurse practitioner, you know, physician doing the, the testing and coaching patients through the efforts um, is very important to make sure that you're getting quality data when you're doing this. Um, as we said, this is, if you look at the contraindications here, it's very similar to what we had talked about for the bronchial provocation or that, the methacholine type chesting, um, is that anything where you're going, where sudden increases in your intrathoracic pressure might cause an uh, issue with other organs would be contraindication. So an acute MI within a week, uh, unstable cardiovascular status, so severe hypertension, pulmonary embolism, significant arrhythmia, um, anything, again, so brain, thoracic, abdominal uh, surgery within four weeks, because that sudden <sighs> is what will, will cause quite a bit of trouble. Um, eye or middle ear surgery within a week, same thing, sudden increase in pressure with the forced expiratory flows is really not safe. Um, a recent pneumothorax, uh, and then you get into things like so a known aneurysms, hemoptysis of unknown origin, obviously infection, uh, related concerns. Late term pregnancy, it's the same thing. That sudden pressure is, is probably not good unless you want to be delivering a baby in your office. Um, and then inability to age. So extremes of age is usually what you'd say is really young or really old, especially when you get into dementia or delirium. It's just because it's an effort dependent. If somebody doesn't understand the test, the number you're going to get out of it aren't really helpful. Um, in general, what I would say, you know, if you had any of these as, as contraindication, if you had a very urgent need for it, then you would, you know, within a month or two, but ideally you're waiting three to six months to, to sort of give time to let all of this settle before you're gonna be coming back in patients like this. Um, unless again, you're, you're very pressed, it's needed for a pre-surgical assessment for a big surgery um, and they, you know, they won't proceed without it, then you can shorten your timelines. But ideally we, I would try and give at least three months with anyone like this if it's a reversible um, problem. If it's not a reversible problem, then you, you would just have to use other uh, means of testing or you're stuck without pulmonary function testing. Um, some of the, the words we're going to throw around, because I, I think having the definitions are, are very important. So forced vital capacity basically means the total volume of air that can be forcefully expelled from your lungs. So from full to empty is, is how much can you pull, can you get out in that one breath? Um, and so your, your FVC sort of shows as, as your, your full value of or volume of air that you're able to get out in your whole breath. The FEV1 is basically the forced expiratory volume in the first second of a breath out. So you get that sudden second out and then it, it empties beyond. So the FEV1 we use as a measure in respiratory disease just because it's a, a reproducible number that we can use. It doesn't really mean it's, it's the only one, it's just how we've standardized everything. The FEV1 to FVC ratio again is, is basically a measure that will tell us airflow obstruction versus, um, or it will, it will quantify airflow obstruction and uh, we're going to see sort of on the restrictive side. And then the peak expiratory flow rate is basically this maximum blast of air. This peak rate up here is your peak flow. Um, and then depending, you'll see two different ways. If we have, if it's a full pulmonary function test, this is actually off and then the scale for the volume is reversed. But all of the ones we're going to be talking about today where we just have spirometry, is it, it sort of starts at zero and moves up. So this becomes your forced vital capacity um, you know, this amount of air up to some amount is the residual volume that you have left when you've done breathing out all of your air um, and then the peak flow. But we're, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the shape of what this curve actually means as we go. Um, and so the, the first, again, in general, with most spirometry, you're approaching it and you're saying, well, there's two main patterns we're trying to recognize. There's obstruction and then there's restriction. Um, obstruction, as we said, is, is your asthma, COPD, uh, even you know, cystic fibrosis, sometimes bronchiectasis type. Um, and what you'll see, so this green is a normal curve. So this is the expiratory, so it's the sudden blast of air out, um, and that's the big airways emptying. And then what you get is it, it starts to slow. And so these are the smaller and smaller. So we're getting into you know, bronchi and bronchioles and subsegmental down to alveoli, and you're emptying right out until you're at zero. And then this is the inspiratory curve. So they're breathing back in towards their zero volume. Um, and so it's a flow, there's a positive flow, and then this is the negative flow as they're inspiring back in. And it's so in, in someone with milder COPD, usually what we see is their peak flow starts to drop because they can't generate that sudden force. Um, and then these, it will usually sort of scoop out, but their total volume generally tends to stay up. As they get more and more severe, what happens is you develop a lot of, of gas trapping, um, and the gas trapping, so your residual volume starts to take up some of that volume. So it's air you can't get out because it's trapped behind. 
And so what happens is this, the, their, their full volume curve shrinks. So it, it pulls away and it starts to squeeze itself in, but you get this really profound scooping, which is injury and damage to all of those small airways. Um, so this would be the picture of somebody on their full volume curve with relatively severe obstruction. If their peak flow is shrunk, the downward curve is, is more bowed than you'd expect, and it's pulled away from what's considered the maximum at the normal curve. Another way of looking at it, if you said instead of a flow volume curve, if you looked at it as a volume time curve, is that they're not able to move volume as quick. And so you think, again, obstruction, the trouble is they can't get air out. They can get it in fine, but they can't get it out. So if you think of your classic COPD or, or at really bad asthmatic who's uncontrolled in your office, that, uh, and they just keep breathing out and out and out, um, is they have a slow or a long sort of time constant for, for emptying within their lung tissue. And so what you'd see is in a normal patient, when you start breathing out, you get this sudden blast of air again, all the big airways, and then you hit some plateau where you've emptied out everything and there's just no more air to get out. As you get mildly obstructed, they're slower to get that air out. And then especially as they get into these medium and small sized airways, it's just they really slowly empty. And again, in your, your really severe obstruction, these are the ones that they'll keep breathing out. So normally we do a six second expiration. And in you know, normal and moderate, by the time we get to six seconds, most of us have no more air to move, we, you're, you're empty. But in a severe COPD, what you'll actually see is this hasn't yet hit a plateau, meaning they're still trying to empty all of those little airways um, that are, are, are there. And so they would keep breathing out and they'll hit a plateau somewhere down here, like nine, 10, 11, 12 seconds. Um, and so on the flip side of things, you'd say, well, what about restriction? So restriction, again, is a tightening um, or sort of increased elasticity to the lung, which is more like your interstitial lung disease. Um, and so what happens with them is their peak flow is actually quicker. They're like an elastic band in their lungs. So when they empty it, it goes really quick, but then there's not a whole lot more beyond that to move because it's so stiff. And so what we see is this sudden blast of air out that actually sometimes will, will go much above what's considered the, the normal expected peak flow. But then they have nothing else that they're, the, the other airways rapidly sort of empty and they, they've lost or scarred away all of what should be the, this gradual um, downward. So we usually see it's a quick up and then they get their inspiratory and it's just, you know, a short inspiratory curve as well because everything is tightened and, and quite um, restricted. And so how you would see that on this volume time curve is that in them, same thing, it's a sudden rapid movement of air and then there's just nothing else. They rapidly hit the plateau early on because they can't move those little airways. It's all scarred away. And so I would like to say that when you're looking at a spirometry, before you even get into the numbers, having that as at least a base recognition of obstruction versus restriction compared to the normal is a very quick way before approaching the numbers to be able to hint to yourself, do I think this is gonna be obstructive or restrictive? And I'm gonna show that as we go through the examples to come, um, is that it, it's actually a very helpful approach to things. And so as you said, obstruction is your asthma, COPD, CF, bronchiectasis type conditions. Restriction is things like kyphoscoliosis, so you're tightening and you're, you're curved forward. Um, you know, obesity, so pressure downwards on the chest will do it. Interstitial lung disease can do it. Sarcoidosis, especially if there's, there's parenchymal involvement, will do it. Um, and so, you know, th that would be recognizing patterns. The next thing is sort of getting into the measures of severity. And, and in COPD, what we usually use is the gold guidelines. And so they would categorize it as mild, moderate, severe, and very severe based on these cutoffs. Um, the severity of obstruction in asthma, if you look, the ATS has their own classification of impairment of FEV1 that we would usually use as, as the measure of airflow obstruction. I'm not going to get into that because it, it's, it's a bit annoying that ATS is actually scaled it differently than gold. So sometimes it gets back and forth. But, you know, in general, what we're looking for in, in asthma is the you know, improvement after treatment and then the degree of airflow obstruction. The severity of restriction, the same thing is that there's an ATS grading document that would show you mild, moderate, severe, very severe, it, and it sort of starts at 70%, um, which you can use. But in general, if you're thinking it's a restrictive process, they should have full pulmonary function tests because the total lung capacity we get off a, a full PFT is a much better measure of restriction than just using the FVC because there's lots of things, and we'll talk about it, that can confound the FVC and make it look like it's restricted when it's not actually restricted. Um, you know, the, the need for further investigation is, is also important. Um, as we said, spirometry really measures airflow and volumes. Um, and so it, it is very variable. And it, this would be the you know, case in point of an asthmatic over time um, is depending on the day you catch that asthmatic, their peak flow can be all over the place. Um, 
And so monitoring over time and having repeat tests is helpful. Having patients like that monitoring their peak flow is also a helpful thing. Um, and depending on the type of lung disease you're looking at, again, a full pulmonary function test is, is much more rich in information that it's able to provide because we get the residual volume, so the amount of air that's left behind after a breath. We know the total lung capacity um, measured, and, it, and it's not confounded like the FVC in certain uh, conditions. We get the DLCO, so the oxygen exchange uh, in the lungs. We get uh, airway resistance and compliance, which is a measure that, that can be helpful for things. Um, so th there is a lot of other rich data that a PFT still provides, and there's, there's definitely still a role for it um, in more complex respiratory disease beyond just spirometry. Uh, and so this takes us to question number two, is you'd say, so what are the post-bronchodilator airway obstruction reversibility criteria in children? And Jennifer, I just have you cue me when there's enough um, response. For sure, the responses are coming in. Just give it another second. Okay, definitely a majority are choosing uh, option number one, uh, post bronchodilator FEV1 increase of at least 12%. Perfect. And so you basically you'd say, uh, so we, we didn't talk about the peak flow, but peak flow is actually also one of them. Within the context of what we've talked about, 12% um, is, is certainly correct. Again, in adults, you would add that 200cc uh, qualifier. Um, again, airway obstruction in children, as we said, the lower limited normal is, is important because the, the regular FCC1 to FCC ratio for many children is, is in the 80 to 90 range. Um, as we get older, it, it often shifts lower. Um, and again, in younger children, expiration is complete quite quickly, which is why we, we shift things. So the lower limit of normal, as we said, in most new pulmonary function testing or spirometry, it will show that. Um, you know, th there is always still a role to refer to a specialist. And so things like diagnostic uncertainty, if you've done the spirometry and it just it doesn't fit or you feel like you're missing something or there's other findings on imaging, it, it's very appropriate. Um, you know, anyone who's experiencing a rapid decline in lung function, despite what you think is a regular diagnosis, should also be assessed. Um, severe symptoms that are disproportionate, so they're, they're way more short of breath, and they have an FEV1 of 80%, um, and, you know, that mild obstruction probably needs a second look to make sure it's not something else. Um, early onset of symptoms, you know, if they're requiring like, aggressive treatment or they're on oxygen, any of these things, really getting a respirologist involved is, is a very reasonable approach. Um, and so that takes us, actually now I, I hope to more that the meat of the, the presentation. Um, I, I hope by now I have convinced you sort of of the utility in asthma and COPD. But then you say, well, how do I approach it? Or what are the numbers? And that's what we're going to focus on now is going through a whole bunch of different cases that we have um, and going through that, like the numerical approach to PFTs. And looking at this, it seems very daunting, but I'll, I'll show you as we go through the cases that there, there's a very, I always say, you know, approach this the same, sort of like if, you're, if you remember learning how to go through an ECG is that you, you always do the same thing in the same order every time and don't get lost in the numbers. Um, is that what you're going to see when we approach it is we'll take a quick look at the flow volume loop because that gives us our hint and those shapes that we have discussed. The next thing you'd look at number wise is you look at the FEV1 to FEC and you're saying is it obstructed, in which case you're over here, or is it restricted? If it's obstructed, you give them a beta agonist, you're saying well does it get better um, or does it, does it not get better? Um, and if it gets better, then it's consistent with asthma or COPD or asthma COPD overlap, and we'll talk about that. If it doesn't, then it's fixed airflow obstruction, and it's consistent with COPD. If they have a normal ratio and there's an improvement, well, then it, it's consistent with asthma. If they don't and you still have concerns for asthma, that's when we get into bronchoprovocation uh, testing, so like methacholine. Um, on the flip side of things, if it's not, so you have a normal FEV1 to FEC ratio, then you'd say, well, give them a, a bronchodilator. If their, their FVC um, remains normal uh, and they improve, you'd say it's asthma. If it doesn't improve, their FVC is normal and the ratio is normal, it's a normal spirometry. Um, if it, uh, the FVC is, is not normal, meaning they're restricted, so there's tightening because their, their total or that their forced volume is low, and then you'd say, well, does it get better? If it gets better and it clears, you could still suspect asthma in some cases. If not, then you, you, we should really be getting into a full PFT to try and look at the total lung capacity. Um, and again, I, I wouldn't be re reviewing this because we'll, we'll show on the cases. So again, here we have a patient, so 25-year-old uh, university student, non-smoker with a history of allergies uh, and current symptoms of shortness of breath when she was running a marathon recently. So again, before we get even into the numbers, if we look at the flow volume curve, we have the green, which is our normal, and we can actually see this patient 
if not actually overshoots the normal a little bit, which maybe not surprising, young marathon runner, probably very fit. Um, and so the, the loops in the pre and the post, so the pre is the blue loop and the post bronchodilator is your red loop, is again, there, there's not any scooping. There's no scooping. She approaches what you'd predict as the age predicted peak flow and there's no scooping down here and nothing is pulled in. Um, so this, even at a first glance, you'd say this looks to be relatively normal testing. There's nothing here that sets off alarm bells. And so then the next, if you get into the numbers, you just say, well, what's their, their FEV1 to FVC ratio? Um, and we're looking, so there's your pre-bronchodilator and here's your post-bronchodilator. So 0 0.86, 0 0.87, so not obstructed. It's not less than the age predicted lower limit of normal, which for her age is 0.75. Um, the next thing you'd say, so if we know there's not obstruction, if you remember from it, the next thing we'd look at is the, the FVC. And so you'd say, well, her best is 113% of normal. Um, so there is no evidence of restriction. And then was there any change in the FEV1 post bronchodilator just by chance? There, there was. So she has a normal um, ratio. She has a, a normal FEV1 and a normal FVC and her curve is normal. So this is essentially a normal test. Um, and that would be how we approach it here. So FEV1 to FVC is normal. We looked at the FVC, it is also normal. Did she improve or was there any post bronchodilator change? No. So she's considered a normal spirometry. Um, and so the numbers sort of stack up like this. And so that's the, you know, the, the general approach to things. And that's why I say I always do the same thing is look at your, your loop, your ratio, your FVC if it's normal, and then your FVC1, is there any reversibility? And so at, at this point, what we're going to do is there's, there's two cases. So that the group is going to be broken into two. And there's about uh, actually eight minutes. We're just going to go through some cases to, I think, paint out some of the, the background stuff. And then what we're going to do is we'll come back to this main session. And there's about eight to 10 other spirometry cases that we're gonna go through in detail. And we'll pick our way through the numbers and, and sort of solidify some of that approach to things. Yep, that's that sounds really great. And just given the time, we may shorten that eight minutes up a little bit, but let's try the breakout rooms. And then, yes, everybody, we will be back here very shortly uh, to go through the specific spirometry cases that are in this presentation. Um, there was just a question that came up right at the end of our session around, if you had somebody who is being or who you, you suspected of asthma or COPD, and we're living in the world we are now where COVID has, has shut down a lot of the available spirometry options. Somebody said, well, what can you do about it? Um, the one thing I should mention before we, we launch right into the cases is, is if you don't have access to spirometry and you have a strong clinical suspicion of a, a diagnosis. Oh. Sorry, buddy. I was everybody staring at my face rather than hearing me. Um, if, you, if you don't have access to spirometry, um, but you strongly suspect the, the diagnosis, it's still very appropriate to make an educated you know, assumption and treat them as if it's that disease with the plan then to go back and do spirometry once you have access to it. Um, and then you would sort of correct. If it's a different disease that you hadn't recognized, you would adjust your inhalers. If it's no evidence of it, you'd say, well, maybe we should be de-escalating or stopping the inhalers. Um, but if you don't immediately have access, it doesn't mean you can't treat. It's just you should plan within that patient's sort of treatment plan to get back to using inhalers, or sorry, to, to get to, to spirometry. Um, yes, and, and, and we could hear you, Dr. Davis. We, we could. We could. Yeah, we could. Um, and so it, it, now we sort of get into the meat of it and, and what I assume most people are actually here for, which is the, the cases um, to go back through things. And so, uh, you know, without further ado, we would say, so we have our 26-year-old female. She's a, a non-smoking, which is a key thing. Uh, she's got experienced shortness of breath for several years, and she's got allergies to dust mites and mold. So immediately with that story, you can start to form, a, you know, certain assumptions in your mind about where you think things are going to end up. As we said, the, the first, before you even look at the numbers, is you look at the full volume curve. And immediately here, you're saying, whoop, the pre-bronchodilator, the peak flow is impaired, there's lots of scooping, and it doesn't quite reach out. So there's an element of gas trapping there. So that is not what I would expect the curve to look like in a 26-year-old. But interestingly, you can see right away, the post bronchodilator does get a lot better, which suggests there's reversibility. So before I've even looked at the numbers, I, I, I'm expecting that this is probably a restrictive with a, a fair degree of, of reversibility. Um, and so it's a nice way to uh, approach things. In her, you know, her pre bronchodilator FEV1 is, is certainly obstructed. So her lower limit of normal is uh, 0.74. And we know, as we said, her post bronchodilator level is, is also still obstructed below her age predicted lower limit of normal. So when we go down our, our pathway of, of diagnosis, she has obstruction. And then we'd say, well, how bad is the obstruction? And so pre-bronchodilator, it, it's 54%, which by the, the ATS criteria, which we didn't touch on, 
would be considered moderately severe. And post, there's a 53% improvement by volume. So there's a 960 cc improvement. That's this giant increase that we have here. So that is far more than 200 cc's and 12%, which would say we have lots of reversibility. Um, and then, you know, as a, a quick check, then you'd go to your FVC and say, well, the FVC is above 80%. There's no other restriction that's hiding along with this obstruction. Um, the other thing that we didn't touch on when I was going through things is, is in newer PFTs, you will see these bars where essentially this line is the, the predicted. If you imagine this is like the bell curve. So the 5% the bell curve, it goes up and then it comes down like that. And what you're expecting is most people fall these these lower limit of normals is it's 1.645 and it, it's some statistics um, uh, sort of voodoo. It, it, most people should fall within plus or minus 1.645 standard deviations of the the, the predicted amount. Um, and so that's what these are showing is it's saying the FVC is low but not outside. You know, post it's right on, and the FV and FVC is is obstructed on both sides. So these are visual representations based on the the standard deviation outside the, the, the predicted that you can also use. And often they'll be represented as what's called a Z-score, um, but that's a whole other sort of kettle of fish to thing. Um, and so again, with this, you'd say, well, what objective test, if we took a step back, um, oh, it looks like it's, it's, I think we're a question ahead. Oh, we're on Q4. Yes, Gloria, we're, we're at Q3. All right, so maybe we'll stop this question. Uh, I'm launching again. Yeah, okay. There's David, Q3. you're also on um, speaker notes view. So you, I'm not sure if you want to re reshare. Oh, you can't see the, the screen? No, well, we, we can, can see, see we can see the screen and the speaker notes. So go to display settings at the top left. Oh. Just hit that display settings. And then um, it actually asks you, yeah, uh, swap there. There you go. There you go. Okay, so people are answer during that. People have answered number three here. So, what objective tests are required to support asthma diagnosis? So, spirometry, and then if negative, a bronchial provocation test. That's uh, what most people are saying. Perfect. And so that, that would be exactly it. We start with spirometry and then we screen to the next one, um, which is that bronchial provocation test. And so going back to our patient here, as we said, her ratio was obstructed. So she's, she is, is less than age predicted lower than of normal. We gave her a beta agonist. Um, there was a significant improvement. And so in her, you'd say, and this is where we, we always have to qualify it, is it's consistent either with asthma or COPD or asthma COPD overlap. And it, it depends on the right clinical context. So in her, she's young, she's a non-smoker. She doesn't have the exposure, so she, she can't have a diagnosis of COPD. Some very severe COPD, and the reason we include that there, can have bronchodilator reversibility. That doesn't mean they have asthma. But again, she's not within that range. So you have to sort of know, ha knowing the patient's background history is very helpful. And where we say this asthma COPD overlap, um, if I scroll forward, is if she had sort of some residual, because in her case here, we'd say post bronchodilator, we still only get her up to 83% of predicted, which is not as good as you might expect her. You know, she's 26 and otherwise healthy. We would hope she gets up into the 95, 100% range of what's predicted for her. So the concern in this not coming back up to normal, if she had say 10 or 15 years of smoking, might be that there is asthma and that's why we see the reversibility and that the residual that's missing could relate to an underlying element of, of COPD. Um, but you, you can't sort of make that, that diagnosis on this. And in her, where we know she's a non-smoker, what you'd assume is, is that loss in FEV1 is generally what we label as chronic airways remodeling. So she's had uncontrolled or poorly managed asthma for a period of time. It has caused injury or scarring to the airways. And as a result, you, you don't get back up to 100% because you've damaged those smaller airways. So you've essentially lost that lung function. So this becomes a, a warning sign in a young asthmatic that we, we need to get on with treating them because if we don't and that stays low, that's going to be a problem more and more over time. Um, and so, you know, you would report this, you'd say it's an obstructive defect, there's significant response with bronchodilator, and it's consistent in a, you know, young non-smoker with a diagnosis of asthma. Um, and I, again, I would add that, like, if I was reading this, I would add the qualifier, there appears to be a mild element of chronic airways remodeling because this isn't getting back up to 100%. Um, which is is more important in the you know the longer term for for treatment. 
uh, if we go to our next case, so we have uh, it's a 78 year old male retired accountant. Uh, he's got a 46 pack year smoking history. He was married to his wife, who was also a smoker, so both primary and secondary smoke exposure. Um, quit four years ago and comes in with a, a history of chronic cough. In him, same thing. Is he? And we'll touch on this question in a sec, so if we don't trigger that. Oh, we trigger that. Um, so you, first of all, you'd say, well, is this an acceptable test? Um, based on what we have access to here. Okay, everyone's uh, saying yes so far. Oh, so, yeah. yep. And so again, the reason that we're, they're trying to catch you on this is that as a, a first hint, um, as we said, shrink, um, it is in your flow volume curve. Again, before we even approach the numbers, you immediately see peak flow is impaired. There's significant, significant scooping, which is not what I expect. So that supports obstruction. Um, and it doesn't change pre and post. It's a fixed. So right away, even just looking at this before I've looked at the numbers, I, I, I would say this guy looks like he's got fixed, relatively severe airflow obstruction. The reason they're saying is, you know, acceptable is he, as he was expiring um, in his six second uh, sort of expiratory phase, um, in his, so his six second, which is where we usually cut it off, he's still expiring. He's emptying. He's got that delayed emptying, um, but it doesn't make it a non-acceptable uh, test. It's just representative of his physiology for his lungs. And so we'd say, we, we know what the curve looks like. When we come up to the FEV1 to FEC, he is certainly obstructed. So 0.43 pre and 0.39 post. So it does not reverse the, the obstruction um, with bronchodilator. And then you'd, you'd, your next step is you'd go up and you'd look at his FEV1. So he's 59% before and he's 64% post. So not a significant reversibility. Um, as I had talked about even before is that COPD in the more severe obstruction will often have some degree of volume reversibility. So you'll see sometimes the FVC might reverse. That doesn't indicate that there's any element of asthma there. It's just they're so obstructed that some of those other areas will open. Um, but in him, you know, his obstructed ratio, you would call this moderately severe that sort of comes up to moderate post bronchodilator. Um, and again, that's the, the ATS criteria. And his FVC is not impaired. So he has fixed moderate airflow obstruction um, with, with no evidence of reversibility. Oh, and sorry, I've, I've, I've stolen my own thunder here. So I, I hope people get the answer right here. Um, so we might just skip by this in the, the, the spirit of time. Um, but yeah, so he's got fixed moderate airflow obstruction without reversibility. So that's very consistent with that of a SCOPD patient. Um, and this would, by CTS criteria that we've gone through, you, you would be able to say that you know, this gives you the diagnosis of COPD. Um, and that, again, that's represented, so you can see it here as well, if you do have one of those where he's got an obstructed ratio, his FEV1 is, is low and his FVC is preserved, so there's no restriction. Uh, if we get to case four, so 62-year-old male aircraft engineer, long-time smoker, shortness of breath uh, with exposure to cold air, um, and it comes down to the same thing. Uh, and so if we, uh, if we sort of put it to everybody else now, if I force you to, to put yourself on the spot and you go through those same steps, Okay, we have some answers coming in. COPD, some asthma COPD overlap. Those are the two people seem to be choosing back and forth. Perfect. Yeah, um, so most are choosing asthma COPD overlap. Perfect. And so, and, and, and this is where, again, it, it gets into the, you know, the nuances of, of, of respirology. Um, is, as you say, we go through that, you know, that the, the process, because they say you do the same thing every time, all the time, and then you won't get lost in the numbers, is that we look at the curve. So there, there's the peak flow is a little bit impaired. There's distal scooping, which would say there's some small airways troubles. Um, and there does appear to be some reversibility because there's an increased post. So immediately I'm thinking this is obstructive with a degree of reversibility um, in a long time smoker. So it, it, that already frames a lot of information in your mind. The FEV1 to FEC ratio certainly is fixed. It's, it's well below his age predicted lower limit of normal of 0.65. Um, and his FEV1, so he's, he's moderately severely impaired, and he does have quite a bit of reversibility. So he gets up to 75% post, which by volume is about 41% improvement or 700 for so way more than the 12% um, and 200 cc. Uh, and often what you will you will sometimes see in, in stuff like this is, and it, and again, this gets into the nuances of, of there is not 
an accepted CTS definition for asthma COPD overlap. So there, there are different people do different things. And often what we'd say, if there's a concern for COPD with asthma hiding on top, we try to be more stringent. So we usually say like 15% and 400 cc's as your post change, which he again, easily crosses that threshold. Um, and so in, in this one, you would report it as um, you know, partial reversibility is that there is, but his ratio doesn't reverse to above the age predicted lower limit of normal. So he has some degree of, of remaining fixed airflow obstruction. And so that's why you would say asthma COPD overlap is he has the reversibility consistent with asthma, but he also has the fixed airflow. So the FEV1 doesn't correct itself to above the age predicted lower limit of normal. Um, and his FEV1 doesn't correct itself. So there is some degree of damage underlying this that is, is fixed. And in a smoker, you'd say, well, maybe that's some emphysema or chronic bronchitis. The reason that A is also actually a correct answer is that he could be one of you know, the genetically lucky people who could smoke all their life and have no trouble with their lungs. And this is just the results of very severe asthma and airways remodeling over time. And spirometry alone, and even really pulmonary function, don't give us those answers. Um, that ends up being uh, often imaging and clinical history and, and sort of a clinical gestalt to it. Um, so the, the correct answer here is, is really, it could be asthma with airways remodeling from someone who's got long-term poor control, or it could be asthma COPD overlap, which is that you have the underlying damage from the cigarette smoke. Chris, uh, just a question that people may be interested in knowing. Do you think it's possible that this person would not completely reverse uh, if they've been chronically obstructed? I know that I've seen that in, in a lot of cases, somebody who's had obstruction for quite a long time untreated and you do the testing, they reverse to a certain extent, but not completely. What do you think about that? Yeah, well, and, that, and that's where it would get into, like if he was completely untreated, you know, that, that label up front, you'd say, well, it could be asthma, it could be absent to see if we do over that. What I always am curious, and that's where future downstream testing is helpful, if he was more of a pure asthma subtype, you might hope that if you started him on more regular treatment, especially inhaled corticosteroid, that you might actually see some of that continue to improve over time versus if it's like fixed, fixed, it would be more supportive that it, it's uh, you know an underlying COPD or the, the fixed airflow obstruction from Aries remodeling. So it, that one, you, again, you're, you're still sort of stuck never knowing and that's where future testing and monitoring is, is quite helpful. Um, so it would be it would be reasonable to just treat this person as an asthmatic and see how they improve over time and then make a decision about the final yeah. diagnosis. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I mean, in this case, yeah, the, the CTS guidelines for someone like this is that you would they would absolutely need treatment with an ICS containing regimen. So you'd usually say, like, you know, an ICS lava would be your first go to in someone like this. Um, if they continue to remain symptomatic, then they're going to end up pretty rapidly on triple therapy because of the concern for an overlap syndrome. Um, but yeah, it would be very reasonable to treat and sort of remonitor. All right, thank you. Um, and so that takes us to case number five. So we, we get down to, we have a 22-year-old female. She's a, occupation's a chicken processing worker, a lifetime non-smoker, but comes in severely, severely short of breath and with a bad dry cough over the past week. Um, and again, so before we even look at the numbers, we look at the flow volume curve, and this is a very different picture. This is again, that the warning sign of, of terrible, terrible restriction. So much so that she's not even able to actually get above. It's an early restriction. Usually you get that elastic spring. When it gets really bad in restriction, is you can't even get that elastic spring. It's so tight that there's just no recoil in the lung. Um, and she is missing all of this. So it's all of the volume that should be up here in a normal expiratory breath is it comes out and you got nothing else to move. So that immediately here is saying this looks like very severe restriction, which when you look at this would be supported. Her ratio is actually a little bit above the normal. Um, and both of these like fall off the scale. There's so many standard deviations below where you'd expect for someone her age. Um, and so you'd say, again, going through the that algorithm that we had walked our way down, is her FEV1 to FVC is normal. So the next thing you're gonna look at is you go right up to the FVC and you'd say, well, is the FVC normal? And no, it's not. It's only 17% of predicted. So that is very, very severe restriction. Um, and then you'd say, well, in this case, they didn't even do bronchodilator reversibility. Um, and, and so there's no bronchodilator, but, this would be consistent with you know, very severe restriction um, and would be highly suggestive, especially in someone who's a poultry worker of, of something like a hypersensitivity pneumonitis or a bird fancier's lung or poultry worker's lung. Um, and so th this would need you know, immediate assessment with a respirologist. It would need a, a CT scan to characterize further. But the, the gist of it here is 
again, the, as the FVC tightens and shrinks, the FEV1 is going to drop. That doesn't mean there's obstruction because the, the FEV1 to FVC ratio is not less than the lower limit of normal. Both of these values are pulled down by the fact that her lung is just super, super small and restricted. I'm just going to jump in for a second, just, just because you highlighted uh, that there was no post done. You know, one of the things that I often talk about with people is that if they're looking for a diagnosis, that they should always order a pre and post just to kind of get that message across. And, you know, as per the algorithm that you flipped up uh, earlier, that some people may have a pre that looks normal uh, and they, yet they reverse. So just to keep, keep that in mind for people. Yeah, and I, I, yeah, 100%, I, I would back that up, is that there, there is a very, very, very limited number of cases where you should do pre with no post. Um, in most cases, it is much better that it's a pre and post, especially at the initial diagnostic phase. Um, it, is, it is very important because if you're lacking that reversibility, say she had been a 10-pack year smoker and we didn't have post, you, you can't make any assumption. You can't call it COPD if she's obstructed because we don't know does she reverse. Um, so the pre and post is, is a very helpful element to things. Um, because if you know if you'd done it here and she had a whole bunch of reversibility, it it, it would hint that there might be something else that's there, and, and so it would give you a more you know, depth of information to potentially work with. And just uh, along the same lines, because one of the one of the participants asked a question. Melissa was asking a couple questions about utilizing pre and post in somebody that uh, already has a diagnosis. You know the the benefit of doing that to kind of assess control. Just wondering what your thoughts are about that. Yeah, so I like to do the, or we tend to do it where we, you know, we do a withhold of, of medication just to get an idea of that degree of reversibility. Because in someone who is a chronic asthmatic who's on a regular inhaled corticosteroid, even if that's withheld before, that effect doesn't wear off before testing. Um, and so if they're really well controlled, we, often you'll see that the reversibility shrinks or disappears um, versus they still have this gigantic reversibility. It would suggest there's probably an element that remains under control. Um, so I tend to like that. If there's someone who I'm very worried has very brittle control, then I would say we would do, you know, a pre with no post and you just leave them on their medication. So their testing is essentially considered post bronchodilator because they're on all their long acting med. Um, and then you can just trend over time. So I, I do have a subset of patients where I will on follow up, keep them on medications right up to testing and then not do a post because the concern is if you stop them even on their for a few days before the testing, you might unseat their control. That would be sort of the exception to, to use when you're saying you're not going to pull them off their medications. And I, I know that uh, I've sometimes done a pre and post with somebody that I'm wondering whether there's not good adherence to medication, you know, so, you know, demonstrating reverse, reversibility might indicate that they're not actually taking their meds and may help reinforce uh, to go ahead and take their meds. Yeah. Which is, which is, again, that's where I always use that same, that, that post bronchodilator, if it's a gigantic improvement, especially in an asthmatic, then you're saying, like, you know, the, the, the chronic meds should be controlling this and should be keeping you generally well reversed. So, yeah, it, it, it can be a helpful way to sort of give them a number to shake your finger at them for. And the same person was asking uh, how frequently you would do testing on somebody that's controlled. You know, how often would you? try to get them to have uh, repeat spirometry if they did have control. Yeah, so if they're generally well controlled and they're not having any exacerbations and they, you know, they're compliant with medications um, and they, they don't, you know, we have the CTS criteria for, for well controlled asthma. Um, as long as they're not checking any of the boxes there, generally every, you know, one to two years, it's a reasonable way to, to get a look at things. Um, if they're less controlled, then you're getting down to the, you know, every six months to a year, um, if they're having more frequent flares. Uh, because in the end, you're, you're still using other clinical factors like their report of cough and mucus and wheezing. You're looking at the number of rescue uh, doses that they're taking. You're still looking at eMERGE presentation with admissions to the hospital as other surrogates to try and gauge control. Um, but at least, you know, intermittent, uh, so poorly controlled six months to a year, well controlled, you know, once a year, every second year, depending on largely your availability of spirometry. So if it's really hard to get, you're probably okay to push it out in someone who's well controlled. If it's very available in your clinic, at the very least, you know, once a year, it would be a, a good measure to have in someone. And if somebody is controlled, how long would you, how long would it take before you would consider de-escalating medications titrating down? That was another question. 
Oh yeah. So I, I mean, it would usually be in that that same vein. I am probably a little bit more conservative. I, I usually say like I like to have people well controlled, not having any flares for around a year before I'd start saying let's pull things away, especially if they're not having side effects. Generally, the inhalers that we would use have a low side effect burden. They don't interact with other medications like other oral medications. Um, there's nothing sort of addicting to them. As long as they're rinsing their mouth, your risk of thrush is is generally pretty low. So because the the medications overall are, are generally well tolerated. I prefer to have a longer period of time where they're stable and then you'd look to start de-escalating things. Um, you know, if they're really well controlled and they're on really high doses of stuff, sometimes people go into hospital and get put on everything. Um, then, you know, at a six month period of stability, I start pulling things back. But anywhere between that six months to a year is a general sort of safe guideline. All right, thank you. I'll just jump in quickly. I think there's time for one more case and then we'll ask if there's any more questions. Does that sound, does that sound okay? Yeah, that sounds great. Uh, and so case number six. So again, we have a 17 year old female. She's a high school student, non-smoker, allergies and anaphylaxis in her background. Um, and she's coming in with cough and upper respiratory tract infections lasting over the past four weeks. Um, and so again, in her first thing, we look at our, our flow volume loop. She's a little bit below the peak flow, but not terrible. It doesn't appear to be a significant change in her, her pre and post. Um, and she's not really scooped. So up front, you're saying, you know, there's nothing there that immediately jumps out at me as being concerning. Um, and then when we look up, we'd say, well, she's not obstructed in her pre or post, um, and especially her post is not less than her age predicted lower than the normal. Um, seeing that, we, the next thing you go up to is you'd say, well, what's her uh, her FEV1 doing? It's above 80, so it's no range of normal. And is there any reversibility? She has 230 cc's, but she's only 11% by volume, so she doesn't meet that criteria. And that's why we use this in, in adolescents is that it, it normalizes for, for differences in body size. They're really, again, really big and tall and the, the sort of short and rotund. Um, so this does not count as bronchodilate irreversibility. So here you'd, you'd have someone who's not obstructed, has no bronchodilate, or sorry, has, has no impairment in FE1 and no reversibility. And her FVC is also within the range of normal. So there's no evidence of any restriction. So despite her symptoms, this would be interpreted as basically a normal test. There's no significant bronchodilator response. And if we go back to the case you know, where she's cough with upper respiratory infections, that would certainly raise your concern for asthma, but it doesn't necessarily absolutely mean there's asthma. This sounds like it's more of a post-viral bronchitis uh, type syndrome that she's appearing with. Um, so if it's really pervasive and really disruptive, you know, short-term use of, of either things like Ventolin or Atrovent to, you know, for a few weeks afterwards to help clear it, or if it's really bad, a, a short course of an inhaled corticosteroid can be used. Um, but she's not someone who fits the criteria for asthma. If you really still had persistent concern and she's saying, you know, when I play sports, I get wheezy. And if I'm around cats, I get wheezy. Um, and you haven't caught it here. She would be a perfect candidate to say, well, we should progress into a methacholine challenge test in you to try and see if there's something we may be missing. Um, if it's only with, you know, flare or only with infections that she's having this develop um, and she's otherwise fine all the time and does everything without any other limitation, be less pressed to do a methical Um And so I, or do we have time for one more? Do we, do we want to cut off new questions there? <clears throat> I'm not hearing any questions. I might just launch into another case because I figure this is what people came for. Yeah. Um, so if, if we say case number seven, so 14 year old female, non-smoker, allergic rhinitis, uh, no medications and no current symptoms, you know, the ideal. Same idea here. You're coming in and you're saying, well, does she have any, is there anything that that to me? And you'd say, no, you know, that looks like a nice curve. There, there's no evidence of anything that's there. Um, and actually, this is a good one to, to close on because this is one that you often see. Um, and so she is not obstructed. Her pre is, but her post is not. Um, she essentially just has incredibly large lung volume. So when you're looking at her FEV1 and FEC, they are way above the sort of 120% that you, you'd expect, um, which is not necessarily indicative of a disease state at all. Really what you're seeing here is she likely has what we would describe as like anatomically large lungs. She's just a big kid. Um, so she's probably taller. She's one of those like plays basketball and looks like she's in high school when she's playing at you know 14. Um, certain kids hit their growth spurt and especially you will see this in children quite often. Um, she's just an early bloomer. She's probably a bigger thoracic cavity than age predicted. So she's at the, you know, the pinnacle of the, the standard deviation curve, which is what we see. Her volumes are really big. Her FE runs really big. So it almost makes her look like she's obstructed, but it, it's not. It's just she's got really big lungs. 
um, for her age category. And so we'd say she's not obstructed, her FEV1 is well above the range of normal, and she doesn't have any reversibility. Um, and as we remember, she didn't actually have any symptoms. She was just being screened as, as part of you know, routine testing. Um, so she does not have any diagnosis. So uh, being above the expected range of normal, in general, is, is not diagnostic of any disease. It's just a large anatomic variant that you would then correlate. Like you'd see her in your office, and is she twice the size of most 14-year-olds, or is she a big, tall 14-year-old? It'll fit. Um, so that's going to sort of fit with your, your signs and symptoms. So I, again, that's where I, I think we will end, because we do, I, I would like to leave a few minutes for questions here. Um, let, me, uh, let me jump in with one of the questions that came up early in the talk uh, from uh, Caroline. So if I understand, understand their question, they were asking about uh, the reuse of Ventolin for pre and post testing, you know, in terms of disinfection protocols. Uh, oh, yeah. so, you at, your, at your lab with things like that. Yeah, so for the, the Ventolin should always be used with an aero chamber and even the disposable aero chambers have a little baffle inside of them. So it should allow flow of, of the, the, the jet out, um, but it, it should not allow, as the patient can inhale the, the Ventolin that is suspended in the air chamber, but they can't breathe back into the air chamber. Um, and so in our lab anyway, we use a disposable air chamber with a small little one way valve. Um, and even the like legitimate big plastic air chambers are the same. You, you can't breathe back into it. So it should allow flow in one direction. And then we just wipe down the, the Ventolin um, cartridge, but there, there shouldn't be any way that it can transmit back sort of through. And so as long as you're discarding the, the disposable air chamber, and they come as like little plastic cups that can be assembled, um, it shouldn't be a, a concern as, as far as uh, sort of infection control. Thanks. Uh, another recent question. What do you think of the recent trend to treat costs with Ventolin in the absence of asthma? Does it really help or should they be on prednisone for a cough? Oh, uh, so I mean, in general, if patients have a, like a significant post-viral cough that is lasting for quite a while, it immediately plants that thought in your mind, you know, if this is a more pervasive symptom, is there asthma that's hiding there and just has been under-recognized? And that's why they're holding on to the cough a lot longer. Um, again, if it really is an isolated cough just after an infection, Ventolin can be helpful, but the problem is all it's doing is bronchodilating. It's not actually treating any of the inflammation. And in most cases, the physiology of what's happened is you've had a bi-viral infection, you have airway inflammation, that inflammation triggers um, the cough reflex, which then you just get stuck in the cycle. So um, within the literature, there's actually slightly better evidence for the use of either long or short-acting uh, muscarinic agents. So like your, your atrovent, because it's a muscle relaxant that will sort of open up and try and release some of that. Um, and then there, there, there is also evidence for, you know, the short-term use of an inhaled corticosteroid. But I, I say that short term is, is the, the key is that they need to be followed up after the fact. And if the symptoms have resolved and they are back at baseline and they don't have any other signs or symptoms of asthma, they should be stopped off the medication. What I think all too often happens is we, we put them on either an ICS, or we put them on a combined inhaler because we have access to it or we have samples in our office. And then we, we forget to come back to it and, and cut it. And then patients sort of morph into this, this asthma diagnosis without necessarily truly having it. Um, so they can be helpful as a you know, topical anti-inflammatory or topical muscle relaxant, if you will, to, to try and reduce cough. Um, prednisone would be if you had a really rip-roaring cough and you were really bad and really sick, um, th there is certainly a potential role for prednisone, but then you have to be very cognizant of the you know, blood pressure, muscle weakness, cataracts. Like prednisone, you're paying a price if you're treating with it. So I'm actually relatively sparing with the use of chronic cough and prednisone because the side effect burden is so high. Um, and again, if someone's needing prednisone, especially routinely for a cough after an infection, that should plant in your mind a pretty, like you need to look for asthma in that patient. Right, right. Somebody was asking about uh, exercise challenge tests being difficult to access in the GTA uh, other than TGH. Uh, are you familiar with other locations? I don't know, does your site uh, do that? Yeah, so I am, um, am not uh, sort of in the, the, the Toronto area, but it, it's, it's true. Exercise challenge testing is unfortunately pretty limited across the province. Um, you'd have to sort of explore with your, your own local hospital system to see if that is offered. Um, and in, in general, it's a, you know, a more limited um, resource. Um, yeah, you just have to sort of investigate within your own area. The, the exercise testing is, is 
a hard one to come by because there is even some centers that do cold air exposure testing, but that tends to be usually a bigger hospital. Um, and again, all of that is, has been very limited over the past few years. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, I can't, I can't give any specific details for. Jennifer, does the, the Lung Health Foundation have sort of resources that people could look where there, there is availability for exercise challenge testing? Is that something that you guys track as well or not? That's a great question. It's, it's not something we're tracking like uh, right now. So um, I, I don't have that information for people, but um, certainly we'll take that away and we can have that discussion. Okay, thanks. Yeah, no problem. Um, we have uh, a couple more minutes. We'll take a couple more questions. Uh, somebody was asking, uh, how often is exercise-induced asthma really the diagnosis versus uncontrolled asthma? Sorry, say that one again. Uh, how often is exercise-induced asthma really the diagnosis versus just uncontrolled asthma? Oh, yeah. I mean, and, and that's why I would say that, you know, the, the likelihood of, of purely isolated, just exercise-induced asthma is, is a relatively small subset. So even if you're not able to access, even to go back to that prior question, you know, ex specific exercise testing, most people should show on others. So if methacholine is more widely available, most patients will tend to show on that. Um, because it, it, it sort of goes with that bronchial hyperreactivity. So there, there is probably a fair amount of, of exercise induced that are, are truly just uncontrolled asthma. Um, and that's why, you know, using those other surrogate signs elsewhere in their life. And if you dig into it beyond just, oh, I'm short of breath when I play hockey, you might say, well, is it the cold air? And if you step out of a, you know, a warm building in January, do you find you get the same shortness of breath you get when you're playing hockey? And then some people might say, oh, yes, I do. And then you ask, well, you know, in the summer when you're on cut grass or trees, do you, and, a lot of it is the skill of the person asking the questions to try and show that it's not just, because again, it, it's, it's often quite impressive how little insight people have into the shortness of breath and the symptoms they have until you start asking them. Um, and so that's where, you know, a detailed asthma questionnaire to try and get to other triggers that they might not recognize is actually very helpful to broaden it beyond just saying, well, you have exercise induced asthma to you have general asthma and relatively symptomatic. Okay, and maybe uh, one last one, just along the same lines. Somebody was asking about uh, younger athletes being given the Ventolin before sports. We, we dealt with this with the uh, asthma case uh, during the breakout sessions. And I, I think the uh, resounding theory is that you should definitely consider uh, spirometry testing on somebody who's been using Ventolin pre-exercise uh, you know, to, to see whether they have an underlying asthma diagnosis. Yeah, 100%. I would, I would not just be leaving somebody on, on Ventolin sort of chronically, especially as a youth, to say, oh, it makes you, you do better on your sports game when you take your Ventolin. That would be a very slippery slope. They should be confirmed. And the way the guidelines, and again, that's a whole other talk, would, would be structured right now for, um, for asthma diagnosis is that you should really be thinking about a, a regular use of a controller, so a, a corticosteroid in the background there. And just uh, quickly, Sarah, just uh, post in, in the chat in case people didn't see it around the question about exercise challenge testing and the GTA, that it is available at Sunnybrook and St. Joseph's Health Center, so Unity Health, for people that are trying to access those, uh, those uh, testing. So I'll send it back to you, Jennifer, because I know we're out of time. We're just uh, at time right now. So uh, thank you, Dr. Tamari. Thank you, Dr. Davis, for uh, being here today and providing this excellent session and discussion around spirometry, the how and the why. Um, I just want to just note for people that there are some other opportunities um, for, um, let me just go to it here. Yeah, so some free evidence-based online courses uh, through Mac Health and uh, in partnership with Mac Health, we've we have a number of courses available online. So please check them out. Um, promote better lung health outcomes in your practice. And the other piece I just wanted to quickly touch on is that we do welcome healthcare professionals to join our network. Uh, we this is where we offer you meaningful opportunities to collaborate and directly contribute to design, delivery, and, evaluate, and evaluation of strategies and policies to improve the lung health of Canadians. So um, definitely want to encourage people on the call to, to check that out as well. The, um, the information is there so that you can check it out. Thank you again to Dr. Tamari and to Dr. Davis. Um, everyone, please fill out the evaluation. You'll be sent a link. And we... Um, we are, we're really happy that you joined us today. So thanks everybody. And that's it for now. Thanks. Thank you everybody. Appreciate everybody showing up. Bye. -bye.